Well, welcome to uh, In the Valley of Novelty. Uh, I understand we'll meet here all of our sessions, and tomorrow's session begins at 9 and runs till noon. Correct me if any of this is not the case. And then tomorrow afternoon's session runs from 2 to 5, is that it? 2.30 to 5. And then a Sunday morning session. So uh, I see familiar faces, unfamiliar faces. Uh, we, these things are most interesting, at least to me, when they're directed by the agendas of whoever's present. I, can, I have a number of things on my mind, more than a weekend's worth of stuff. All of it is very familiar to me. I know what I think mostly, most of the time. So uh, don't be afraid to interrupt, to ask questions. If you're not getting what you want, it's f fine to take it another direction. Uh, the way I conceive of these things and how they've evolved over the years is originally my enthusiasm was for informing people about uh, the psychedelic experience, especially plants, and how that arose out of shamanism and how it uh, was evidence for Jungian models of the psyche and uh, uh, basically for me the, the psychedelic experience was the path to revelation. It actually worked on somebody who thought nothing would work. And then, uh, and, uh, and that's still a large part of what gets talked about in these weekends simply because uh, there's an endless crop of new people who are interested in using these uh, botanical materials for purposes of self-exploration and doing that safely, sanely, and in a, in a uh, fully aware manner involves coordinating a lot of detail, botanical, chemical, ethnographic, geographical, evolutionary, biological, pharmacological detail which we can spend as much time on as the, as the group will, will tolerate. Uh, what I like to talk about and what I have very little competition in terms of talking about is the content of the psychedelic experience, which is very difficult to English or, or to bring into any other language and which is not predictable or is confounding of the expectations of students of, uh, of mystical experience. And so that was sort of my core specialty, if you will, was the ethnopharmacology of consciousness and the phenomenology of the states there derived. Uh, but after 25 or 30 years of doing this, it bleeds into all kinds of larger categories like what is art, what is human history, what is the religious impulse, what is the erotic impulse, what, are, what is mathematics, uh, and then somehow these concerns shamanic, oracular, ecstatic, always garner to themselves a prophetistic aura. What is the future? And uh, can it be known? And is it mundane? Or is it transcendental? And on what scale? And on what schedule? Uh, <clears throat> so all of these things are interesting to me. Uh, my personal history, if it matters. Uh, I grew up uh, in a very middle class family in a very small town on the western slopes of Colorado, which is about as white bread culture as you can uh, possibly achieve. Uh, it was a very stable 
environment to be brought up in. It was the 50s. It was all, uh, you know, tube furniture and bad television. And, uh, but the ground I happened to be fortunate enough to walk around on uh, had clamshells 150 million years old scattered through it, dinosaur bones, extinct fishes. And I, as a kid, I was a loner and I spent a lot of time in these dry arroyos and uh, uh, washes where these fossils and stuff could be found. And then, you know, people informed me of the age of these things. And I can remember when I found out that a million years is a thousand years, a thousand times. It was like I got it. I mean, it was the largest thing I could get at that stage of my conceptualizing reality. But then I suddenly, the... The, the reality of the size and scale of nature s snapped into focus for me. And I've been thinking about this recently because one of the things you'll find out about me if we get to know each other is I have a, a skeptical and cranky side and I'm forever puzzled by why people believe some of the seeming to me dumb things that they choose to believe. And, and I spend a lot of time thinking about what is a dumb thing to believe and who, uh, you know, how do you judge in a shrilly competing ideological marketplace the various claims, counterclaims, nostrums, ideologies, therapies, insights, revelations, that are being uh, being peddled, and uh, and so my my uh, intellectual development, if you want to put it like that, was a sort of uh, a a scientific, in the sense that it was always about looking at phenomena, testing it, trying to define its limits. The strange thing that happened to me because I guess I eventually became involved with psychedelics, was this method of testing, demanding proof, never taking anything for granted. Normally what that does is it, it deflates reality. It flattens it. It makes it industrial and existential and post-romantic and horrifying. But in my case, it didn't because psychedelics are actually a kind of uh, miraculous reality that can stand the test of objective examination. I mean, in other words, there's nothing woo-woo about it. It has to do with perturbing states of brain chemistry and standing back and observing the effects uh, they're wrought thereby. And it's extremely dependable. And from a medical point of view, it's extremely safe and non-invasive. I mean, one of the paradoxes of pharmacology is that the substances which most dramatically affect the mind do so at tiny doses and with very little sequela. This is extraordinary. I mean, it's almost as though the mind in this case is a phenomenon very different from the body, where, you know, to achieve major effects in the body, often uh, massively invasive procedures or large doses of invasive chemicals have to be used. Someone once said to me, referring to LSD, that if you wanted to picture at the molecular level of the power of LSD, imagine an ant that can rip the Empire State Building apart in 30 minutes, one ant. In terms of the scales and the sizes of what's going on, that's an, a reasonable analogy to the power of LSD. So I, I explored all kinds of fringe areas when I was a kid, uh, magic and telepathy 
and Ouija boards and uh, various invocations, some of which interrupted my career as an altar boy. Uh, you, you couldn't have it both ways, it turned out. And one by one, these things fell, you know, in the same way that as you go through life, you close the door on Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny and so forth and so on as you move along toward adulthood. But then I discovered that this, the, the psychedelic dimension seemed to be uh, an exception, that it was though, as though the tidy world of European positivist culture derived from Calvinism and Greek science and so forth and so on had this umbilical point this place where it was all tied together. And if you untied it, it, it completely deflated and you were left staring into something analogous to uh, William James' description of an infant's world. You were left staring into a blooming, buzzing confusion. Well, uh, you know, what, what is that? What are the implications of that? It wasn't a confusion chaotic enough to be simply mind uh, dissipated into thermodynamic noise. I think a lot of people who have never taken psychedelics have the idea that it's thermodynamic noise, you know, that it's just the brain isn't working right, it's firing randomly and then some portion of it is trying desperately to lay gestalts of meaning onto this random firing, and so you get this kind of surreal careening from one supposed illusionary perception to another. Anybody who's taken psychedelics knows this is not a very apt or, uh, or cogent description, that actually these things reveal uh, scenarios modalities, um, hierophanies of emotional and poetic power that are very emotionally moving and sometimes leave in their wake powerful ideas, ideas as powerful as any of the ideas that have moved and shaped uh, civilization. So my, my motivation in talking about these things is that I do not say that this is the only path out of the mundane coil of blind casuistry and entropic degradation. I don't say it's the only path out. It's the only path I found. And I checked some of the other major players, but checking doesn't mean I exhausted them. I mean, perhaps yoga can deliver this. Perhaps Mahayanist metaphysics can deliver these things. Perhaps I was impatient or lumpen or simply not intelligent enough. But the, the good news about psychedelics is that they are incredibly democratic. You know, e even the clueless can be swept along if the dose is sufficient. Uh, uh, Hmm. Yes. Well, so that's just a little bit about it. And other things that are very interesting to me, as I said, are the future. But the future in some specificity, both the rationally apprehendable future that we get when we extrapolate current technologies, current tendencies, and the not so rationally apprehendable future when we actually turn on all the bells and whistles of the historical process and realize that it is inevitably ramping up into more and more hypersonic states of self-expression and that this is what is creating this end of history phenomenon or this eschatological intimation that now haunts the, the cultural dialogue. There is something deep and profound moving in the mass psyche driven by historical forces long in the process of unfolding, but now exacerbated uh, and focused by new communications technologies that are essentially prostheses 
extensions of the human mind and body of enormous and unpredictable power or with unpredictable consequences. So in a sense, what began for me as the psychedelic experience, a personal experience triggered by a relationship with a plant based on certain definable pharmacological phenomena has become like a general metaphor for understanding being in the world and uh, and our historical dilemma because in a way they're fractal adumbrations of each other. I mean history, call it 15,000 or 25,000 years of duration, is the story of an animal, some kind of complex animal, becoming conscious and and staring out then into a kind of universe of infinite possibilities based on what consciousness can do in the realm of energy, matter, light, time, and space. Well, so in a way, the psychedelic experience is like a microcosmic reflection of that. You start from baseline, which is your ordinary lumpen or not so lumpen, depending on who you are, state of consciousness. But wherever you start from, it lifts you up in a process of evolutionary unfoldment that is squeezed into hours. And it goes on entirely in the evolution of thoughts, feelings, and perceptions. And it seemed, it seemed to me for a long time, at least since I read McLuhan and assimilated his notion of tools as, uh, as things which have a feedback into how we see the world, it seemed to me that uh, uh, the psychedelic state was then like a predictive model for what human history wanted to do. Human history wants to break through all boundaries to somehow have a realized collective relationship with, uh, you know, deity or the, that which orders nature or, or some fairly large concept like that. Um, so, for my own benefit and for the benefit of the group, I, it's useful to move around the circle and just hear who's here and what their professional interest or just some something that we can hang a tag on so we know if we're half psychotherapists and half advertising executives or how many hackers are here, how many molecular biologists, something like that. So with your indulgence and Please don't talk long in a situation like this. Lack of brevity is considered proof of psychosis. (laughs) You laugh. (laughs) Why don't you say some little thing about yourself that keys us? Yeah, the implications. It's all in the implications. It has to do with how much intelligence you bring to it at the beginning. You know, if you have, if there's no mind behind the retinal screen, then it's just pyrotechnics, mental pyrotechnics. But it's how much we can make of the phenomenon that that makes it so uh, rich. Yeah, you mentioned the gratuitous grace. This is a f- based on a famous comment by Aldous Huxley. He was asked at one point. What, uh, what is the psychedelic experience? And he said, it's a gratuitous grace. And then he explained, it is neither necessary for salvation nor sufficient for salvation. But it certainly makes it easier. You know, it's like an aid. It's a, it's a cul-de-sac. I mean, we can't suppose that it's necessary for salvation because too many people have gone from birth to the grave without it. But it's, one has attained a very fortunate incarnation, I think, to be in a culture, in a place, in a time when psychedelic knowledge is available. And it's a kind of paradox that in our own time, meaning in the last hundred years, 
all this information has arrived uh, in our laps as the hubristic enterprise of white man anthropology carried back all these medicine kits and mojo bags and sacred plants and so forth and grew them in university botanical gardens and kept the stuff in locked drawers. Uh, it was like a Trojan horse brought inside the city walls of Calvin's Troy. And, you know, now the genie is out of the bottle. I'll have to restrain myself for these long exegetical <laughs> comments uh, on each person's... Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm interested in all of this, too, the rising paranoia and what it means and how to come to terms with the what I call the balkanization of epistemology, the fact that the world is... Whole large groups of people no longer demand that the world even make sense. They're operating on synthetic ontologies that have risen above the concept of mere sense. But, you know, there's a whiff of fascism about that that has to be fully deconstructed before we want to sign up. Yeah. Well, I have answers for all three of your questions. Uh, but it would take a while to unfold it. But as far as this last question is concerned, the official answer is because it came with the conquest, that the, um, that the Strophera cubensis, the Psilocybe cubensis, only prefers the dung of Boss Syndicus cattle. So it was so associated with the cultural genocide brought by the Spanish conquerors. And this is the same reason given why in Mexico, though there are, in, in the Mexican situation, it's a little different. You actually have an indigenous population of native mushrooms, but you also have the San Isidro, the, the cubensis, but it's considered inferior when it isn't by any chemical uh, index. So I think it's a deep, association to the conquest is the only thing I can figure. The other thing may be, and this is a more, a, the, I gave you the official answer, then here's an answer based on my own experience. Uh, though I know that some people combine harmine with psilocybin, when I have done it, it has scared the socks off me. Uh, it seems an unfriendly combination for me. Now, the way I did it was I took half a dose of ayahuasca and half a dose of mushrooms. Do not do this. Uh, if you must combine these two compounds, I think the way you want to do it is take a fairly substantial dose of um, an MAO inhibitor, either pergamon harmless seeds or the banisteriopsis, and a very light amount of mushrooms. But the 50-50 combination was one of the longest evenings I've ever spent. Um, and if I seem not to be going to answer your other two questions in the course of the weekend, remind me, because, yeah, I'm keen to, to get to both of those. Yeah. C community and connection. Yeah, it's important for all of you to notice everyone who's here, because we've our agenda has triumphed so completely culturally that we can't tell ourselves from the rest of the population as we could in the 60s so it's only at moments like this when we emerge out of the darkness uh, and show ourselves to each other and i will sail on to the next to New Age watering hole or institute or whatever, but you should all realize that probably whatever you're looking for, someone in this room could help you out if you could but figure out exactly who it is and uh, what it is you're looking for. Yeah. <laughs> it may come to that, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, we need to think this seating thing through. Uh, this is how we came in, and probably I will do it tonight. But if you spontaneously reorganize yourselves, I won't say anything about it. 
It's interesting that you mentioned the Kundalini thing because those of you who've read my book, The Invisible, or no, um, True Hallucinations, know that my brother and I got into something that was tr triggered by psychedelics and started out as a psychedelic trip, but then developed into either an episode of schizophrenia or a revelation or it depended on who was voting uh, and this can happen and the, these things are the path goes further than most sojourners wish to travel I think I mean the power is uh, is immense and once you find the way it isn't uh, you know, it isn't a matter of, uh, it, it, uh, it can be overwhelming. Someone once said the yogin and the schizophrenic are divers in the same ocean, but one of them has l learned how to use scuba equipment and the other is simply drowning. So the reason for the emphasis on shamanism and on other techniques is you will need techniques if you go into the deep water. Uh, and they can make your life very simple and, and, and save you from unnecessary suffering. Not all suffering is necessary. Maybe no suffering is necessary. Yeah. Yeah, one of the things that I'm keen to talk to you about is you know, there are various models of the psychedelic experience, that it's the Jungian unconscious, that it's the ancestor world, that it's this or that. The one that I'm most struck by is it's the world of the platonic ideals. It's a world very closely related to mathematics. And in a way, the shaman is a, a, a hyper-mathematician, not in that he's proposes theorems and solves them, but that he perceives hyperdimensionally. And the magical power of the shaman, the power to predict weather, to tell where the game has gone, to cure, to uh, uh, have deep insight into social problems within the tribal group, all these so-called magical powers become completely understandable if you believe that the shaman actually attains a kind of hyperdimensional perception. And, you know, also teaching here this weekend is my old buddy Ralph Abraham, who's a, one of the world's leading exponents of chaos dynamics. And he has told me many times that uh, the DMT flash for him is simply and straightforwardly a perception of hyperspace, a coordination, uh, and this is why metaphors like inner eye and inner seeing make sense because, of course, in hyperspace, the inside of the body is no more secret from perception than the outside of the body. So, yeah, I, mathematics is one of the few things I still trust at this point. Yeah, that's my motivation is based basically on curiosity. I mean, I'm fascinated that we've gotten this far. I mean, given that the most economical situation would be pure nothingness, what is this? I mean, and why is nature doing these things? And uh, why is organization have such a tenacity? And and what does it mean that we appear so late in the process and represent so, so, such a difference in the rest of nature? Uh, it's very mysterious. We get used to reality because it's so stable, but in fact, it's an absolutely confounding situation. Besides the DMT flash, the only other thing that I know that's as confounding as that is ordinary consciousness and incarnate being in a body. It's just so improbable, you know.
Yeah. Yeah, well, I was very resonant with the person over here who mentioned Evelyn Underhill's book on mysticism because I also read it at about that age. And I wanted these mystical experiences. Uh, the problem is that the thing that is so powerful about the psychedelics is that they perform on demand which almost in principle you cannot expect of a mystical experience because that would be essentially man ordering God at man's whim, which is not how it's supposed to work. Uh, similarly, you know, waiting for UFOs to come by, you spend a lot of cold nights in the cornfield, but if you were to take five dried grams of Stropheric cubensis and spend the night in the cornfield, I don't know whether you would get UFOs, but I guarantee you by morning your notebook would be full of something. <laughs> so the fascinating thing about the psychedelic is of all of the, it, it, seems to, it seems magical in the sense that it seems to respond to human will. One decides whether this is the evening or not. And sometimes people have said to me, well, don't you want to achieve these things on the Natch? Well, to me, that suggests a certain degree of out of controlness. In other words, if I were sitting here suddenly to notice that I appeared to have taken 20 milligrams of psilocybin, I would be alarmed. I would be concerned, I would want to know the casuistry of why I felt this way, whether somebody had dosed me at dinner or I was losing my mind or what was going on. On the other hand, if I had initiated the experience, I would be perfectly at ease with it and see the unfolding signposts and, and know what it was. Uh, yeah, it's a difference of sort of waiting in an attitude of the supplicant, the expectant supplicant, or being the hierophant with all the Faustian echoes that that carries with it, and being able to call down the power or go up to the power at will. And, you know, that's a, that's a fantastic thing and a responsibility. Yeah. Yeah, one of the things that inevitably downloads out of all this psychedelic stuff is because it's central to understanding our nature anyway, is how do we relate to our sexuality, to our relationships, to our obligations to biology and romanticism and so forth and so on. And you mentioned monotony, monogamy, and monotheism, or was that the one? Yeah, well, part of what happens with a career like mine is everything you ever say is taped. So then your ideas may change over time, but people will listen to an eight-year-old tape, a six-year-old tape, and so you're like imprisoned or liberated. I haven't figured out which because you're, you must account for every opinion you ever held, even if you no longer hold it. Uh, the toughest thing to figure out is relationships. It is the yoga of the West, but it's harder than yoga. Uh, and it, it, uh, I'm 52 nearly, and I don't feel greatly wiser in this area than I felt at 24. And, you know, I've had a marriage, I've had a divorce, I've been single, I've had long-term relationships, short-term relationships, on and on and on. Uh, this is, uh, this is, um, well, part of what I'll say in a larger context is we shouldn't seek for closure we shouldn't, uh, part of what the psychedelic point of view represents is living a certain portion of your life without answers, just accepting that certain dilemmas will never resolve themselves into some kind of a, of a complete answer. That's why psychedelics are so different from any system 
being sold from one of the great elder systems like Christianity to the latest cult out of Los Angeles. These cults, these cultic answers, always invariably provide a complete set of answers to life's dilemmas at the price of being absurd, but this doesn't seem to bother people. So part of what being psychedelic means, I think, is relentlessly living with unanswered questions. And this relationship thing, this is the heart of the alchemical furnace. This is where the coincidentia positorum is, is a fact in your life and, uh, and my life. And I don't know whether <clears throat> psychedelics make it easier or harder uh, to come to terms with that. They certainly reveal its many facets uh, with, with incredible and sometimes bewildering um, clarity. Yeah. Uh, I think it works faster. Um, you're right, I never have said much about it because my own style was always to uh, weigh the dose. I mean, I guess I'm just that much of an engineering type uh, to, to weigh the dose. With the T, you don't know exactly um, how much you've taken. I had an experience in London one time where the, I went to these people's house and they were serving mushroom tea. And I think it must, the missable portion of the psilocybin must have been floating on the surface because the hit I got from this cup of almost clear broth was staggering and nobody else got loaded at all. I think I got 90% of the thing. So I think if you, don't, if you didn't emulsify it, the tea delivers an uneven dose. Of course, if you're drinking the entire dose, it, it's just a habit. There's n nothing wrong with doing it that way. Usually in my mushroom taking career, I was the grower. And so I was, I somehow, the, I just wanted to eat it directly. Like usually that's how I do it. I just don't even, it doesn't for me require honey or anything to wash it down. They get a little rasty, that's right. And if they're rubbery, then they can have secondary bacteria and stuff growing in them. So in that case, adding hot water, giving them a splash of boiling water probably isn't a bad idea. Uh, yeah. The, you know, it's a frustrating situation because the literature tells you that DMT occurs widely throughout nature, distributed through grasses, uh, mammalian brain tissue, um, leguminous trees, uh, rubiaceous plants. But when you actually go to try and get it out, you encounter two problems. Either it's spread very thin or, and that's the, if it's spread thin by simply gross overwhelmment, you can get it out. But the other problem is it often occurs complexed with other tryptamines of very nearly the same molecular weight and they have activity you don't want, cardioactive activity or like that. So practically speaking, in my own experience, the cleanest source of DMT is Socotria viridis. And uh, if you can get hold of it and grow it, you will obtain a clean source of DMT. But you, basically, you need five acres in a tropical country to do it right. Uh, that's why I have five acres in a tropical country. <coughs> what? <laughs> well, it is Schedule 1. Uh, oh, pardon me? Yeah, all DMT is Schedule 1, but there's a weird catch-22 around that. I mean, we all contain DMT. So, you know, it's like the universal holding law. Everybody's holding. Everybody is potentially out from under the umbrella. The Probably, though you may not wish to hear this, the shortcut, the easier path is to just 
pull your, tighten your belt and learn organic chemistry and make it then from scratch or, you know, from tryptophan or indole or something. Uh, but it's a puzzle why there is so little DMT because as a synthetic process, it's not that difficult. It's certainly far less difficult than making LSD or something like that. But it's vanishingly rare in the underground. One reason for that may be, you know, if you sell somebody a gram, they may leave a significant portion of it to their great-grandchildren. This is not a drug of abuse where what people like are drugs where you sell somebody a gram at 8 in the evening and at 11 o'clock they're beating on your door to buy two more. This is not like that. Uh, uh, you know, it, it is... You mean what is it doing there? It's not really well understood. The people who identified it, their best guess was that it had something to do with very rapid shifts of short-term attention. In other words, a shot is fired, everyone in the room turns and looks in well under a second. That is possibly those shifts of attention are mediated by DMT. The fact that, uh, that it is so dramatic as a psychedelic experience but goes away so quickly makes it an ideal chemical to use in these kinds of short-term reactions where something spikes and then very rapidly returns to its baseline. But what it's really doing in human metabolism, we don't know. Uh, DMT, like many psychedelics, competes with serotonin for the serotonergic bond site. Um, Interesting then that drugs like Prozac and Zoloft, these new antidepressants, they also relate to, though in a different way, the serotonergic system, one of the four major neurotransmitter systems that operates in the human brain. Uh, it's no surprise to me that these extremely effective antidepressants are emerging out of uh, meddling with serotonergic chemistry. DMT, it, many people experience it as orgasmic or ecstatic. Uh, ecstasy is not simply joy. Ecstasy is an emotion of very great complexity that hovers almost on the edge of terror sometimes. But uh, uh, you know, we could speculate that the orgasm is an interesting phenomenon and what is the chemical basis of orgasm and why does it occur at all, uh, since in many animals it doesn't occur. And in fact, as you advance in the animal phylogeny, orgasm becomes more common. Well, it's... Uh, I would bet that the chemistry of orgasm, the chemistry of DMT, the chemistry of mood alteration <clears throat> in the next five or ten years, this will all be uh, pieced, you know, deconstructed and understood. I mean, the recent flap of, about Viagra will be as nothing when a drug is discovered which causes orgasm. And chemically, this is probably not far out of reach. Orgasm is a pretty general spectrum chemical response that you ought to be able to pharmacologically mimic with reasonable facility. I'm sure some of our best people at our pharmaceutical companies are hard at work on this. Yeah, but I digress. <laughs> that sounds fine. It, it's, uh, I mean, I'm not commenting on the price, I'm commenting on the pharmacology. And if you take two grams of pegamin harmala seeds well ground and a sufficient amount of the root scrapings of, uh, of Mimosa stiles, which is the Brazilian species, and then the conspecific Mexican species is uh, Mimosa taniba folia, teniflora. Uh, as far as we can tell, chemically these things are equivalent. That works. 
basically if you're serious about pursuing this you need to get into the habit of growing things and gardening or you need to sharpen up your chemistry chops and actually become a synthetic chemist well the jungle ayahuasca you know you don't need that much harmine or harmaline to inhibit your monoamine oxidase people tend to overkill on that I think that the jungle ayahuascas, they have a cultural value system that places emphasis on vomiting. They even call this stuff la purga. They want to vomit violently and dramatically. Uh, we're not so keen for that. So we don't need such an amount of harmine or harmaline. So you can, you know, if you're fiddling with this, you can cut it back. Uh, most people use pegum and harmless seeds to inhibit their MAO. You don't need more than two grams of that. At two grams, 90% of the MAO in your body is fully inhibited for four to six hours. And more than that is simply kicking up your gastric response. But these things are available legally by now. Oh yeah, there's a, been a whole revolution uh, there are seedsmen who sell the makings of all of these things. Uh, and Jonathan Ott's book, Ayahuasca Analogues, the, I guess what I'm saying is it's not as easy as it sounds right off the bat. You may spend a few evenings not getting off or a few evenings wandering in some fairly peculiar mind states before you finally grab the brass ring. Uh, but it's out there. It's out there. Uh, yeah. I, I had no idea. <laughs> so, <laughs> you, you mean you had no idea that that this was a, a category of human pursuit, and that people came to workshops like this and talked botany, chemistry, and all this stuff? Yeah. Well. I, I agree that it's a weird subset. It's a weird. <laughs> well, maybe bong making. How do you do? Thank you. My name is Nicholas Kuczewski, and I'm a federal narcotics agent. <laughs> I'm here to do my job, and I can tell that many of you are arguing Schedule A substances at this moment, probably all of you. <laughs> we can do this easy, we can do this hard. The easy way is this, and I'm... Tonight, I'm the cover of darkness. You bring these substances to my room, and I'm... Morning, there will be no questions asked. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> so, you were warned. You were warned. <laughs> well, Wallace Stevens was an insurance adjuster, and he managed to get good mileage out of it. So you just can't tell, you know, God is in the cabbages. So. <laughs> Uh, my name is Birgit. Uh, I went to the jungle in Peru and I was got two mushroom journeys by myself, stumbled across one of your books, loved it, and I'm here to hear what you have to say. Doubtless some Amazonian shaman had lost it for you to stumble over. <laughs> yeah. I'm Larry. Uh, I manage a group of uh, internet products for a large phone company. And I've been involved in the net since the late 80s and have been struck for years by the fact that a very significant percentage of the people who have been building the infrastructure for the last 20 years are also very deeply involved in psychedelics. And uh, I'm here to learn a little bit more about uh, possible ways we can maybe leverage the, the net for the archaic uh, concepts that you've uh, espoused in the books. Yeah, it's incredible the connection between the psychedelic culture and high technical culture and how this is rarely discussed uh, but the people who build
built the internet, who conceive of these complex machine architectures, the people at the cutting edge in AI and chaos theory and uh, dynamics are all graduates of these experiences. Yeah, there's a new book. I see it's in the bookstore here. The Maya Cosmogenesis 2012, John Jenkins' book about Mayan archaeoastrology, astronomy. If you're interested in all that, his book pretty much put, you know, lays it out in greater detail and in a more scholarly fashion than anybody else has done, because there is a lot of loose-headedness around when it comes to talking about the Maya. But this guy is a very good scholar and is, as always the case, the real truth is more astonishing than any myth. So if you're interested in all that, uh, check it out. And we will talk about the Maya and the time wave and the millennium and all of that stuff in the course of the weekend. Yeah, all this is fascinating. I mean, I've pursued the paranormal my whole life and you know f out of 52 years I've been in its presence for maybe five minutes but those five minutes were absolutely real I mean at, at least under some conditions you can understand what another person is thinking you can even look into their memories but what those conditions are, how to return to it. Uh, but it, it just, but having seen it only once or twice in my life, that's enough. You know, miracles are not bought cheaply. I mean, some people would have you believe otherwise and that there's telepathy all around you. Well, maybe there is, but not that I could see. But on the other hand, functioning as a skeptic, there still were encounters at certain points that were uncanny by any rational standard. Yeah. What do you mean that exactly by experience of the primordial? Well, I wrote a book called The Archaic Revival, where the I yeah, where the idea there is that that we are discomforted. Civilization has made us uncomfortable with our humanness because these various technologies and phonetic alphabets and things like that have rearranged our sensory ratios from what they were in Paleolithic times. And that, in a sense, what psychedelics do is they hit your reset button. They address the animal body. They address a deeper level than cultural conditioning. And so you feel and experience these atavistic images and feelings that civilization has uh, repressed or transmuted in you. And, you know, the whole premise of that book was that... Uh, that the 20th century, in many of its cultural manifestations, from Cubism to uh, Dada, abstract expressionism, jazz, sexual permissiveness, hallucinogenic drugs, youth culture, a whole bunch of things, were all uh, impulses toward the primitive, toward a return to a primal state of social organization and that really this is the, the overarching metaphor of the 20th century. The 19th century saw the triumph of hierarchical order, gentlemanly values, class structure, all that constipated European stuff. And then the 20th century is experienced as chaos, you know. Cubism is created when Picasso brings African masks to Paris and begins painting them. Freud announces that we are not just Christian ladies and gentlemen, but right beneath the surface, the incest drive, cannibalistic drives, extremely violent primitive impulses are there. Uh, jazz introduces syncopation into music. 
uh, women begin to display more of their animal nature through flapper dancing. I don't know, you can figure it all out for yourself. <laughs> the point is, the whole of the 20th century is a turning back toward these uh, values that had been repressed for millennia, not only by Christianity, but by the Greek scientific philosophy, the phonetic alphabet, urbanism, agriculture itself. There was a very long period in the human adventure uh, when all of those things lay in our future. And we were far happier, uh, I think, then but judging by our lack of need to make egoistic statements by building vast religious monuments or enslaving each other or setting down codes of laws, so forth and so on. And of course, we'll never be like that again, but there is an impulse in modern society to recapture those values. And psychedelics are hugely effective at doing this. I mean, all this talk of shamanism and Native Americanism and getting in touch with your body and honoring gender shifts and all of this stuff is basically rooted in a, in a more psychedelic attitude, a less, a less categorical and uh, constipated and print-defined, McLuhan would say, attitude toward social roles and social uh, polity. Yeah. I'm Tom, <clears throat> and I, I teach literature and mythology, and uh, I've been experimenting with my own um, forms of exploration for many, many years. It, but as many of you have said here, much of that for me has been a kind of um, individual quest, a kind of... Um, and I just thought uh, that uh, the opportunity to um, meet you and to, to uh, interact with the rest of you who shared some of the same kind of, of uh, interests in opening up our minds and our experience and, uh, of course, the quintessential expression of that through language that you bring to that. It's, and, and along with that, the kind of interacting, as, as several of you have, have mentioned, on um, looking at some of the same um, areas that we're that we're intending to explore. I, as I as I've, I've watched us go around the group and heard and felt in myself the resonance with a number of the experiences and expressions that many of you have had, I, I realized how at, at, at some other level we all seem to have a kind of, of shared experience that is somehow coming into a focus here and that is perhaps being given expression but most eloquently through you, but I think through our need to be here, through, so that's how I felt about it, that just the need to come and somehow just um, be part of this experience with with you and uh, with you, and uh, I'm glad to be here. It's not really a coincidence. It's sort of hard to avoid me on the internet. Uh, there's just so much stuff, not all put there by me by a long shot. Well, did we touch everybody? Did everybody have their say? Well, it's always interesting to me to do these around in the circle things. Uh, first of all, it seems to me, I mean, maybe this is self-congratulatory, but it seems to me that, it, that people are extraordinarily serious and uh, together. I have a, a real nose for nuttiness, and I didn't so much as twitch this evening. And this is a large group. So uh, don't loosen your, your chains too much, but uh, congratulations for s impressing me anyway as very sane. Uh, this is an area where I think sanity counts. 
there's no, no points gained for being fanatical or maniacal. This isn't an area where you have to push the process. The process can push you harder and faster than you may wish. So it's, once you get to this place on what a, we might metaphorically call your spiritual quest, once you get to the place where you hear about psychedelics. The issue is no longer then uh, about where is the gas pedal and the spiritual vehicle. The issue suddenly becomes where is the brake? Because you know this is the fuel to go where you want to go. This is the power to lift you where you want to be lifted. Those issues are somehow now overcome. It becomes a very different game now, a much subtler game. The doorway stands open, if, and all it requires is courage, which is not to say it doesn't require a lot. It does require a lot, but what it is is courage. You know, very few people go to the ashram for their daily meditation with their knees knocking in terror over what is about to sweep over them, they are pretty confident that they've got it confined and nailed down. It isn't so with this. I mean, I've done it many times. There are many people here who've done it many times. And, and the, the survivors are not confident. It doesn't build hubris in you. It doesn't promote bravado because you know how quickly and horrifyingly it can cut you down to size if you, uh, if you presume it or if you presume you understand it or if you presume to use it. Uh, so sometimes the issue of magic and power comes up. I wouldn't get near that. Uh, my goal is to see more, to understand more. And what I do on a trip is damn near absolutely nothing. You know, I have two or three J's rolled in front of me. If I can get through them in the course of the evening, all goals have been met. Um, to, to see, to understand, to remember. It's, a, it's an incredible statement about our humanness. It's a double-edged statement about our humanness that within us, under the influence of these plants, we have literally Niagara's of alien beauty. I mean, I, when I go to Manhattan, I go to the Met and the Guggenheim and I haunt the galleries of Soho. When I take mushrooms, I see more art in 20 minutes of behind the eyelids hallucination in total darkness than the human race seems to have produced in the last thousand years. Well, so on one level, that's an incredible statement about the human capacity to generate and be in the presence of beauty. But the paradox is that so few people know this that our ordinary styles of being, our ordinary relationships to plants, our uh, uh, main brand religions, almost never carry us into the sense of this potential for beauty. And when I was young, you know, in my early 20s, uh, wandering around India, trying to sort all this out, having taken some psychedelics, but reading uh, yoga texts and Mahayana texts and all this, I discovered in every culture there is what I call wise old man wisdom or wise old woman wisdom. You know, in every culture at evening, you see sitting on porches men smoking pipes, old men. And these guys know something. They know something about life, how to till the soil, how to raise a family, how to, you know, shepherd children through their marriages and so forth and so on. But what I did not find in these cultures was any knowledge of this gratuitous grace. 
this is like a secret of some sort. And it's a true secret in that telling it does not give it away. I know this because I've been trying to tell the secret for 25 years to anyone who would listen as you listen tonight. And I don't know how many people hear at what level people hear me. And there are many problems. First of all, uh, there's the problem of dose. It's a physical problem. You can take a little of a psychedelic substance or an effective dose or a lot or too much and medically not be in any particular danger. The LD50 of these substances is such, uh, let's take psilocybin as an example. Psilocybin is effective at 15 milligrams for a 145 pound person. But the LD50, the lethal dose, is something like uh, 110 milligrams per kilogram of body weight. In other words, hundreds of times more than a dose that would you would swear you were melting down, you were becoming the earth, you would never live to tell the tale. And actually, you're in no medical danger at all. So people have experiences of different dose levels. I've always been interested in what the literature describes as effective doses. What this means is that you're so loaded that a guy standing there with a clipboard looking at you is completely convinced you're totally loaded. You know, all pretense uh, dissolves. At these higher doses, um, the machinery of phenomenological description begins to come to pieces on you. And in my experience, someone mentioned the difference between mystical experiences and psychedelics. There are enormous similarities and enormous differences. If you study the mystical literature of Hinduism, Christianity, Buddhism, it all triangulates toward unitary states. The, the you know, Bodhi mind, the white light, the ineffable, the unnameable, the radiance, vocabularies like this, which indicate some kind of homogeneity. Well, in my experience, though when you push LSD, there is something somewhat like that. LSD is not my idea of the paradigmatic hallucinogen. It's different in many ways. Uh, psilocybin is more the paradigmatic hallucinogen. And when you push it, there seems to be not this merging into the radiance, but a revelation of multiplicity, of detail, of complexification within complexification. Everything gives way to everything else. Everything is interconnected to everything else. But the impression is one of an overwhelmingly bewildering perfusion of phenomena. And, you know, I've discussed this with lamas and these sorts of people, and they say, well, you're just, you're in the realm of samsara. You're in the realm of the multiplistic. Perhaps, but the sense of a hierarchy of judgment doesn't feel right. Somehow this all and everything, this teeming multiplistic universe that is revealed seems to carry a message of ecstatic and transcendental import. Uh, it, it, uh, it's all and everything in Gurdjieff's phrase. And one of the ideas that I want to explore with you in the course of the weekend is, you know, most discussions of psychedelics orbit around what will it be like when I take it? Well, that's very interesting and, of course, important to the individual. But to me, an equally interesting question is, what has been the impact of this experience on the evolution of human beings over hundreds of thousands of years. In other words, what is it that we share with this planet 
a kind of uh, co-evolution, not only with another order of being, which it certainly is, but the great confounding fact that I've brought back from my excursions into these places is that there is an organized intelligence in there, out there, over there, uh, far more alien than the cheerful pro bono proctologists that haunt the trailer courts of uh, the less fortunate. A, a truly alien uh, presence, not interested in our gross industrial output or in imparting, uh, you know, salutary technology upon us. Uh, well, then what does it mean that our culture has sealed us off from this information? I mean, our culture claims under the aegis of science to bring us news of quasars, uh, Kiliochasms of time and space away, news of the activities at the nucleus of the cell, at the heart of the atom. And yet, here's a world that begins right behind your eyebrows that any mention of it either brings talk of mental pathology or how you've transgressed certain laws of the village. Uh, uh, in other words, this culture has reared the edifice of uh, empirical understanding and modern science and uh, uh, existential philosophy. This edifice has all been put in place in complete ignorance and denial of a fact of experience that is approximately as easy to access as um, orgasm. I mean, by different means, but nevertheless, not far away. And yet we, we in the West have navigated for 1,500 to 2,000 years with this uh, simply an easily repressed rumor. Uh, how did we get into this situation? Uh, in other words, if there was a primordial era of shamanism and plant symbiosis and... and uh, a mediated relationship with nature through the Gaian intelligence, how did we fall then into the domain of, of post-Renaissance, post-medieval, post-industrial culture? And then what is the implication for the future of in this dark hour of complete um, overcommitment to technology, economic solutions, rational reductionism, materialism, so forth and so on. In the darkest hour of our commitment to these things, this news arrives from these repressed aboriginal people that we have marginalized and, uh, and uh, humiliated in the process of building our own version of a global culture. Well, uh, obviously, I'm not going to try to answer these questions tonight. But this, to my mind, you know, in the 11th century, when the Islam swept across Asia Minor, in Isfahan, in Iran, they built these immense mosques with mosaic vaulted roofs. And one of the great historians of Islam said of the city of Isfahan in the 10th century, he said, it is half the world, a single city, half the world. In a way, psychedelics are half the world. And yet how few people have ever visited these sites, have ever stared into these particular vistas of beauty. Uh, and, and as was said in going around the circle, the impact of these psychedelics, where they hit us hardest, is in the domain of visionary imagining and the effort to communicate about our visionary imaginings. In other words, where they hit us hardest is in the domain of art and invention and novelty. And we have built a culture that however hostile it may be to the psychedelic experience, it is incredibly uh, friendly 
toward novelty, innovation, creativity, cultural evolution, uh, celebration of difference, so forth and so on. So I would like to believe that uh, the long prodigal journey of Western humanity to a well-nigh perfect understanding of the nature of matter and energy and space and time, that that prodigal journey can only be redeemed and made meaningful if the things learned in the shamanic descent into history, which it is a shamanic descent. I mean, we have achieved what the alchemists only dreamed of, and we've achieved it, strangely enough, by abandoning their illusions. They were ep epistemologically naive. You do not discover fusion by endlessly rarefying mercury. You do not disentangle DNA by heating chemical vessels in horse dung. Uh, we had to abandon the naivete of alchemy to achieve its goals, which were mastery of space and time, uh, control of human longevity and health and psychological well-being. Well, at the center of the alchemical ideal was the idea of the stone, something part mineral, part mental, part spiritual, something drawn out of nature, but perfected by human artifice, and then reflecting back upon man a perfect world created through magic. This is the faith of the Renaissance Magi, Marcello Ficino and Campanella and these people. It's, it's a different idea than the idea of man as a fallen creature and, or, or science's notion of man as a mute witness to a meaningless universe. The magical ideal that these things fertilize and support is the idea that humanity is somehow the co-partner, a full partner in creation and that what, what uh, God has brought into being, the human imagination uh, can perfect and it's a necessary faith for our time because the power that we have is so great if the power that science has given us does not serve a transcendental ideal, then it will serve uh, some kind of fascist ideal and most people will be reduced to equations and uh, parts of, of a machine that does not serve the human individual or the human community. Psychedelics are uh, a catalyst for the imagination they raise the ante in the historical poker game. They show that there is more than one way to skin a cat. And we have come to a, a place of bifurcations, immense choices. The decisions and the processes that are put in place in the next 20 years will probably put the stamp on whether humanity and this planet are made or broken as a cosmic concern. Well, consciousness is the key. What, what we are, what is dragging our boat is an absence of consciousness. You know, we are, we have one foot in angelhood and one foot in the identity of a carnivorous ape. And the tension between these two on a global scale is excruciating. So if psychedelics, if there is one chance in a thousand that they contribute an increased measure of consciousness to this situation, then they are uh, a precious gift, a resource, an option, a possibility uh, to be explored. I don't advocate these things because I think it's a sure thing or a, or a safe path to, uh, to uh, the eschaton, I advocate them because they're the only game in town. You know, if hortatory preaching could have done the trick, then the Sermon on the Mount would have been the turning of the corner. 
But we have Buddha, we have Christ, we have these examples of enormously insightful spiritual beings who have delivered their message and humanity has continued to flop on the seamy side. So uh, it's, it's not about an idea. An idea is not sufficient to transform us. It's about an experience. And this is the only experience I know that in the time given to us, on the scale given to us, we have a hope of uh, actually cutting through the, the detritus of our historical experience and building a true human community. Well, that's all I really want to say this evening. I've gone over my time. Thanks for being so patient. All of these issues and many more will be reprised in the course of this weekend. Get a good night's sleep and do not attempt to detain me in my attempt to do this.